welcome to today's webinar. My name is Tyler Reed and I'm the Manufacturing Applications Manager here at Go Engineer. Today we're going to be covering some advanced three-axis topics that include undercutting and is really mostly focused on the multi-axis mill operation. I think the multi-axis mill operation is probably one of the least used operations and I'm guessing it's because people simply aren't aware of it. It wasn't until the past couple years that most of our three axis customers had access to this operation. It used to be included only with the four and five axis software. It's now included with the three axis software and I'm excited that it is because it gives us so many extra tools that we don't have in the built in or the standard three axis tool set. So even though this is named advanced three axis and undercutting, really what we're focused on is an introduction to this multi-axis mill operation. The multi-axis mill operation can be used for three, four, or five axis tool paths. But for the purposes of today, we're going to limit it to three axis. Some of the benefits that you see in the multi-axis mill operation over our standard tools like Z-Level, constant step over, pencil mill, is in my opinion, we're gonna have finer control over the tool. We're gonna to have more options available to us. And we're also gonna be able to do undercutting. Unlike the other tool set, we can actually use the top side of our cutters to, we can program to the top side of our cutters. We can use lollipop tools or we can use T-slot cutters to do undercuts. The multi-axis mill operation actually uses a different technology than the standard three-axis tool set. For that reason, there are some differences in how we use it. Some of the options are going to be different. We're going to have different names, different naming conventions in some areas. We're going to have many more options than we're used to seeing. And one of the things that we're going to be doing is we're going to be creating a SOLIDWORKS coordinate system on each one of our parts to help us orient this multi-axis mill operation. Speaking of it having more options, you'll see it has many built-in tools into this one operation. So in standard three axis, you know, we have one feature type, it's a multi-surface feature, and then we might have six, seven, eight different three axis operation types. With multi-axis mill, everything just falls under one operation that has many options. Built into that one operation, we can do roughing passes, we can do some gouge checking, we can do patterns, and all sorts of other things. There is a set process we're gonna follow. We try to be logical in how we approach this multi-axis mill. Uh, because there are so many options, it helps to have a little bit of a roadmap. So we're gonna define a multi-surface feature. This is the same as what we've been doing for standard three axis. One minor difference is we probably won't use the all displayed option. We'll be very particular about the surfaces we choose. We'll manually add or we'll manually add a multi-axis mill operation or we will run it through the database if we have a corresponding strategy. One of the first things we like to do is define the tool, especially if it's an undercutting tool. Then we're gonna define the pattern or how we guide the shape of the tool path. We'll do some entry and retract. The next step, controlling axes is really important and actually sometimes I do this first, especially if it's I'm going down to three axes, but we can limit it to four or five axes from the possible five. We'll generate a tool path and then we'll refine it. Things like links, adding gouge protect, um, maybe overcutting the part or forcing it to go deeper down the part, blending the tool paths, extending it or trimming it at the ends or the finish, all sorts of neat stuff. So let's jump into it. This particular part is a part that uh, I created for the underside of an RC car. It's a, basically a skid plate, and I made a carbon fiber version of it. And that carbon fiber version, I had to hand trim. And trimming of parts is pretty commonly done on five axis machines, 
Um, but we can also do them on three axis, even if the particular part has a multi-axis surface. So this is commonly done when we're doing it in three axis. It's commonly done with the multi-axis mill, and I'm gonna show you how to do that. So we're just gonna do one circuit around this part. There's some unique things about this part. It's not very clean. I'm actually kind of embarrassed to show you parts of it. Some of these surfaces you'll see are not great. I already have a coordinate system built into this one. I'm gonna cover how to create a coordinate system in a different part file. So the first thing we're gonna do is read that coordinate system in under the machine parameters, setup, coordinate system. I'm gonna go ahead and sec accept the uh, stock, the default stock shape. We're gonna new, do a new mill part setup. We'll tie it to the top plane. So this is gonna be the direction we're cutting in three axes. Now I'm gonna create a feature. So it's gonna be a multi-surface feature and we're gonna be cutting these outside surfaces. You can see how bad these surfaces are right here. Pretty horrible. But we'll actually be able to blend the tool path that comes off that. So I'm gonna go through and select my surfaces. Doing my best not to miss any. If we miss a surface, it will probably be evident in the tool path. All right, around this back side. Apologize for all the zooming in and out. Okay, I didn't pre-select that because I wanted you guys to get a feel for what that would look like. When it comes to the strategy, I'm gonna go ahead and select the five axis strategy. The newer databases install with a three axis strategy that gets us exactly to where we want. I'm choosing five because it is gonna create a multi-axis mill operation. I'll run that through the database. And now we can start down that process. So starting with the tool, it created a quarter inch ball nose and mill, I think that's gonna be okay for our purposes. Skipping over to the pattern tab, this is gonna be where we control the shape of the tool path. What are we using to guide the shape? This is one of the fundamental questions that we have to answer when using the multi-axis mill. First, notice right off the bat, we have a lot of tabs in this operation, and then each tab has many, many options. A single drop down could have a dozen or more options. So this is a very robust tool set. This pattern is gonna help us dictate the shape. We have slice, which we'll do on another part. It's basically like a zigzag or Z level. We can do cut across a curve. So we could pick a curve and cut 90 degrees or normal to it. We can do flow line between curves. This is very commonly used uh, within the multi-axis mill. It allows us to select two curves and then interpolate the tool path between them. We can offset from a curve. So offsetting from an edge is probably what I'm gonna use on this part. We can do a curve projection. So we could take a sketch and project it down onto a three axis surface. So if we were doing say some engraving that we want, wanted constant depth or an O-ring groove, we could do that with a curve projection. And then we can have flow line between surfaces. So now we're choosing surfaces instead of curves, which adds a Z depth and offset from surface. So I believe I'm gonna use offset from curve in this instance. And when I choose offset from curve, I'm gonna to have to select a curve and I'm gonna choose this upper edge on my model. I could also choose the lower edge. Won't make a much of a difference in this case. But this is gonna guide the shape of my tool path. My tool is gonna to run along this curve while it's following the surfaces of my feature. 
So in areas where this curve has backtracking because of my bad model, the tool is actually going to do that as well. And we'll be able to blend it out. If you accidentally select something that you didn't mean to, you can just reselect it. Something that helps a lot is to use the SOLIDWORKS selection filters. If I were to hit the E key, notice my icon changes and now I can only select edges. I won't be able to accidentally select a face. Making sure I get every line segment. And we are good to go. I'm gonna hit F6 to clear my selection filter. So that's gonna be my curve that drives my, my model. We can set limits on the number of cuts and in this case, I'm gonna limit it to one cut. The next thing we're gonna do is go to the axis control tab and we're gonna limit it from five axes down to three. But before I do that, notice on the five axis and the four axis options, I have a lot of tools that control the direction of the tool relative to the cutting surface. Those are the benefits of using the four and five axis options is we have a lot of control over the tool tilt and the tool lead and lag angle. As soon as I choose three axis, a lot of those options disappear. Next step in the workflow is we're going to go to the entry and retract area. And we're especially going to take a close look at the clearance. Rather than just having the clearance plane in Z, we can actually do clearance in an XYZ plane, or we can do a cylinder about XYZ, which would be more for a cylindrical part. We're going to go ahead and do a plane in Z. And now I think we're pretty good. I'm going to go ahead and hit preview and see how close we are. That's not too bad. If I zoom in, we can see issues like this. Because of the way my surfaces run and my guide curve, we have the tool sort of backtracking on itself. but it's actually pretty close. There's a couple things I want to do. So under the finish tab, we have some options as to how closely this tool actually has to follow the model. And we have a, an axis along the depth. So we could actually force this tool to go down deeper, which I think I might do. They'll help us make sure our tools as rigid as possible. If I put something like minus, a hundred thousandths and hit preview, notice that this tool path actually jumps down a little bit. So I'm gonna be using a different part of my tool. We also have the ability to blend surfaces by the tool radius and we can also add an additional radius. And this might help me blend some of those funky spots that we saw. When it comes time to simulate, because I use just that basic default shape, the simulation is gonna be a little bit tough to see. I'm gonna show you guys a trick in a second here. We can still run a comparison and we can see, oh, we're a little bit overcut up on the front here. A little bit undercut in certain areas as well. Because we are limited to three axes, the tool can't tilt with the surface. So we're going to have to accept some amount of inaccuracy. This overcutting I could probably fix using the built-in gouge checking. So under the gouge checking tab, I have the option to create up to four different rules for gouge checking. A rule can be set to apply different to different parts of the tool or holder. So I can check against the flute the non-cutting portion of the tool, the shank of the tool, and also the holder. 
Whatever I choose to check against, I can check it against the surfaces, the features, uh, the feature surfaces, or I could check against other surfaces that aren't part of the feature I'm trying to cut. I'm gonna go ahead and check against the feature of itself. And then you can control what it's going to do if it encounters whatever surface you're checking against. Either retract along the tool axis, move the tool away, just remove the gouge positions or stop the tool path calculation altogether. I'm gonna to choose move tool away and then you can tell it what direction to move to. So I could go X, Y, Z within an X, Y, Z plane. I'm gonna go along the surface normal. So whatever the contact point is, it's just gonna move normal to the surface. So it changed it a little bit. I don't know if I like how it changed it. One of the things that we notice as you start to use the multi-axis mill operation is there's so many options that sometimes it's a little picking and choosing as to which one is gonna work the best. This is probably not what I wanna use exactly. And I might actually just accept the fact that I am shaving off a hair probably a couple thousandths off the front end. With this selection here. For this scenario in this webinar. So that's gonna be trimming. Trimming common application within the multi-axis mill. Another common application are complex chamfers or radiuses. So here's a part, this is a relatively large part, it's about six inches wide, very basic, but it has a chamfer along the top edge that would be impossible for us to cut with a standard countersink tool very accurately. So we're gonna use a three axis tool path to step down it. Using the conventional three axis tools and operations, this can get a little tricky, whereas the multi-axis mill operation seems to do it with no problem. I mentioned I was gonna show how I create coordinate systems. I'm gonna go ahead and go through that real quick. This is, gonna, this is going to be a SOLIDWORKS reference geometry. So I'm gonna be under the SOLIDWORKS feature tab. I'm gonna go ahead and start a sketch here. Now your coordinate system, the most important thing is that the X, Y, Z axes align. A second consideration is to put this coordinate system at either your part zero, or if you are, have a multi-axis machine at the intersection of your rotary axes. So under reference geometry coordinate system, the first box, I'm gonna select the origin of the coordinate system. And then I'm going to use my sketched lines to align the X and Y axes. And I'll go ahead and reverse that direction. And that gives me a Z direction. Now inside CamWorks, under the Machine tab, Setup, I'm going to use Coordinate System 2. And then I'm gonna go ahead and hide that. Okay, so let's follow the process. We're gonna do new mill part setup. We're gonna do a multi-surface feature. It's gonna be these surfaces. This process is gonna look very similar to the last part, but we're not gonna limit it to one cut. We'll choose our five axis strategy, run that through the database. So I'm gonna to jump to the axis control real quick. I'm gonna do three axis. I'm just going to accept the tool it gave me, quarter inch ball nose. Looks like it fits just fine. Under the pattern tab, this will also be an offset from curve. I could do flow line between curves, but because these curves are the same shape when viewed from the top, it wouldn't really make a difference. So I could choose one or the other. 
I don't need both. So I'm going to choose offset from a single curve. And again, I'm going to use this top curve. Okay. A sure sign that you may have missed a segment is a lack of either purple or green. And a lot of times a white ball or a white sphere will appear. Okay. And instead of now limiting the number of cuts, I'm gonna use the default option, which is avoid cuts at exact edges. So what that does is it looks at your tool, looks at the surface you're trying to cut and adjusts the first and last cuts so that you are cutting that full surface, but you're not cutting to the full edge. Whereas if I were to start at the exact surfaces, start and end, the first tool path would be centered on that edge. And the last one would be centered on this edge. And I can do that. And typically what I would do, I would add a slight start margin or an edge margin, something on the scale of thousandths of an inch. But for the most part, you'll, you'll use this avoid cuts at exact edges first. And then if you have issues with the tool pass shape, then you might try the other option. I'm gonna do a max step over of about 10 thousandths. I'm just gonna take a guess there. Entry and retract. We're gonna do a plane in Z just like before. I am set to use the lead ins and lead outs here. And the lead-ins and lead-outs are controlled in this area. We have the lead-in tab. We have the type, many, many types. And then if I choose a type, tangent arc in this case, I can do a length and width, or I can do an arc and height. And same with lead-outs. So these are controlled separately. I also have a feed plane here and a skim plane here. They're just values as opposed to planes under the NC tab in the rest of the software. I think I'm pretty close. So let's go ahead and preview this. Look at that. Beautiful. There might be a couple things here under the pattern tab. It's set to zigzag. I might do something like spiral and close the first and last cuts. That might prevent the tool from going back and forth. Again, when I preview this, I'm not gonna get a great preview because I, I am only programming the fi a finished pass on one side. So I can do this, it's not great though. So, and I'm not really gonna have a good idea if my holder is actually colliding and stuff like this. This is pretty common on multi-axis stuff. So I'm gonna show you what I like to do to give me a better simulation. I'm gonna come back to SolidWorks. And in fact, I'm gonna go to the SolidWorks configuration tab. I'm gonna create a new configuration. I'm gonna call it stock. And within this configuration, I'm going to get rid of the feature I'm cutting. In this case, it's the chamfer. I could do that a couple different ways. If I have the feature itself, I can suppress it. In this case, if I didn't have the feature, if this was say an imported body, another cool way I can do is use the delete face option. If I delete these faces, and use the delete and patch option, it will delete them and patch them so that they're square corner. Now that's my stock configuration. If I go back to my default, we're still good here. When I come back to Camworks, within the stock manager, I'm going to use a part file for my stock. I'm gonna use the current part file, the stock configuration. And now if you look at the preview for the stock, you can see that when we do the simulation now, we're gonna get a much better simulation. It's gonna be much easier to see and probably a lot more accurate to the current shape of the part when we go to do this toolpath. So 
So that's multi-axis mill for doing a chamfer. The same thing would work for a very complex radius. Let's look at some undercutting. So this is one of the example files that installs with Camworks. I do have a coordinate system set up at the center of the part. And I do have a stock shape as well without the undercut. If you're curious how I made that stock shape, I just used a revolve feature to fill in the blanks. So I did a sketch on the right plane. The profile looks like this. I pick up this curve very easily by using an intersection curve. So if I use the drop down under convert entities, intersection curve, any curve I select, it will actually give me the intersection within that plane. Neat little tool. And then I'm able to just use a, a standard revolve feature and fill in the undercut. So in Camworks, under the stock manager, we're gonna read that stock shape in. You can see there. Under the machine tab, we're gonna select our coordinate system. We're gonna run through the process again, new mill part setup. New multi-surface feature. We're gonna select just the surface we wanna cut. All right, now this time we are gonna to have to select a different tool because I'm not gonna be able to use a ball nose. I'm gonna to go to my tool crib and I'm gonna add a T-slot cutter. So I click add, it brings up the tool selection filter. I'm gonna choose a keyway. I'm just gonna choose something I think will be large enough. And then we are going to add some radiuses to the top and bottom of this tool. That looks like it'll be good. So I'm gonna go ahead and select that tool and then I'm gonna add a top radius. I'm gonna guess an eighth of an inch. That looks like it will do the job. All right, so now we can go, let's limit this to three axes. Now under the pattern tab, I could definitely use offset from curve and I could use this top curve or bottom curve. I could use flow line, top curve or bottom curve. Um, but because I am just gonna be stepping down straight in Z, I'm just gonna use slice with a constant Z. Slice with constant Z is gonna do just almost like a Z level type finish. Let's do a max step over of a hundred thousandths. Avoid cuts at exact edges, I think is gonna be what we want in this case. We can do a plane in Z. And we'll give it a go. So it's going to do all of the calculations for me that would be needed to figure out how to use the top side of that tool. That 100 thou step over, which is really the depth of cut, was probably a lot finer than what I needed. The tool path is offset from the surface because it is showing the bottom center of the tool. So if we do a quick step over or a step through, we can kind of see what's going on here. If we run a simulation, I'll see how it changes shape. I don't really like that. And that's gonna be under the pattern tab. Instead of zigzag, I can do a zig, or I can do a spiral, which will blend through. If I do do a spiral and blend through the depths, I'm gonna to wanna to make sure I close the first and last cuts. Otherwise, you're not gonna get a full cut in those bottom and top 
layers. If you're not aware, you can adjust the speed of your simulations by adjusting the quality of the simulations. If I pause this and click the options button, which is in the bottom right corner, these sliders control the quality. The higher the quality, the slower the speed. If I bump it down a little bit, You can see it actually moves significantly faster. It's going to be a little bit lower quality, so we might see some banding. When we run the comparison, we might see some color banding. It doesn't necessarily mean we're overcut or undercut, just that the quality of the simulation is not as good as it could be. That depth of cut was probably way too much as well. Let's go back in and instead of a hundred thousands, let's do 60 or 10 thousands, let's do 60 thousands. Now I'm doing this all in one pass. Let's talk about one of the tools that this multi-axis mill has, and that's a roughing. We can do a built-in roughing. Under the roughing tab, we can activate multiple passes. Let's do two passes and the spacing is going to be the XY step over. So let's maybe do an eighth of an inch. You can see we have more cuts. The cuts are going to be taking less material and then it's going to step inwards. So that's pretty neat. We don't have to have a separate tool if we wanted to do multiple passes in Z or multiple passes in X and Y, we can absolutely do that. Let's take a look at a final undercut. This undercut file already has some toolpath on it and I'm gonna try to mimic it. So this is a bung potentially, maybe welded to the outside of a tube. The tube would have the hole cut prior and there would typically be a sharp corner here. Let's use my trick. Let's add a new configuration. Let's use my trick to give us a sharp corner. I'm gonna delete face. I just use the search up in the top right. I never remember where this tool is. Delete face, delete and patch. That gives us a nice sharp corner. So that's probably how this would part would look at. And maybe for flow reasons, you might wanna actually smooth that out. We can do that with a lollipop cutter. Okay, so for the stock, we're going to read in that configuration. The surface is going to be this guy there. That's the surface we want to cut. I'm just going to manually add a multi axis mill operation. Now for the tool, we need to use a lollipop cutter. And this part, it was pre-programmed. It does have a lollipop cutter in the tool crib right here. It's a 5 16 inch pop lollipop cutter. So we're gonna cut using the back side of this as, if possible. 
Process is the same. Let's go to axis control, three axis, pattern. We're actually going to use a flow line between curves this time. We're going to do an upper and a lower curve. So the path of the tool is going to be defined by the upper bound and then it's going to interpolate to the shape of the lower bound. Now we do this because those two shapes are different. They're not perfectly round. Because of the thickness of this pipe, they're quite different. So flow line between curves is a good one to go. We're going to continue using avoid cuts at exact edges. Let's do a zig. This will just go in one direction. Let's do a step over of maybe something like 2000. So this is going to be a very fine step over. Entry and retract. We're going to do a plane in Z. And this is the type of part that the lead ins and lead outs are going to be critical. How we come into that and how we come out of it, we're going to have to, we're going to, have to play around with the lead ins and lead outs to get it correct. So at the beginning here, just to get us some tool path, I'm actually going to use the none option. I'm going to disable lead ins and lead outs to start with. And we're going to go ahead and give this a go. So we can see the shape of the tool path kind of looks like a witch's hat. We are gouging the part we can tell. But uh, by a couple of ways we could do a simulation. And as we watch the top side of that tool make its cuts, we can see it definitely gouges the part, especially as it's exiting. And it's actually not too bad until that exit. So what we can do is we can mess around with the lead ins and lead outs. We can start to activate them and adjust the values and types until we can get it to, when it gets to here, return to the center. Another thing I'd like to talk about is using the gouge checking in this scenario. If I'm worried about the tool having to move too far to the outside and gouging this surface, I can gouge check against it, okay? Under the gouge checking tab, I would activate gouge checking. I would tell it what I want to check against, probably everything but the holder in this case. And I'm not going to check against the feature surfaces. I'm going to check against other surfaces. I'm going to select this little ellipsis. It's going to ask me what features I want to check against. This feature was created. It's just that surface. All right, so I'm going to select that. And it's going to ask, what sort of allowance do you want? So if I'm checking against other surfaces, I can control how close I get to that surface. I could say zero. I'll accept rubbing against that surface, which I don't want. Or how much clearance do I need? And then you can also set a tolerance, which is how closely it actually does the analysis of that surface. And then on the under the gouge check options, we'd probably move the tool away and move it to cut center just like before. So you can see in this pre-programmed option, we do have this other surface selected. We are doing an allowance of 2,000, so the shank and the non-cutting portion can get within 2,000 of that hole. The tolerance is set to one ten thousandth, so we're very closely looking at these. We're moving the tool away and it's moving to the cut center. If I were to disable this gauge check and regenerate this tool path, we'd probably see that it expands outward. All right, so that looked like the shape that we had before. Reactivating this is going to pull that tool inwards in the areas that it gouges. Let's take a quick look at the lead ins and the lead outs on this. Tangent arc on both types and we're doing a length of 30 thousandths and a width of 5 thousandths. That brings it back into the center, nearly close to the center. So this is kind of a nice little tool path. Very interesting application. This would be impossible 
to cut without using the multi-axis mill. So that might be the biggest takeaway for some of you who are watching this, is you have access to that multi-axis mill. If constant step over or pattern project or Z-level or pencil mill aren't cutting it, learn this multi-axis mill because it's going to be used quite often. You've seen how many options you have, especially once you consider that gouge control or gouge check. We can use that as a programming tool. We can use it above and beyond just a safety tool. We're actually using it to program the surfaces. So that about covers it. That's an introduction to the multi-axis mill operation. I could probably show you days worth of parts using that multi-axis mill operation. But this is a nice little intro. If you guys have any questions at this point, it would be a great time to type them into the questions box or the chat window. Otherwise, thank you for joining. Thank you for watching. This will be up on our YouTube page soon. Be sure to check this webinar out and other webinars that we do monthly. Thanks for joining and have a great weekend. Mm -hmm.